in this reaction called the Hoffman elimination, which is really cool is because what we're doing is we're taking a amine and we're going to treat that amine with methyl iodide, uh, silver oxide, and some heat, and we are going to generate a alkene. So we've done a elimination because we have eliminated the amine group and one of the hydrogens off of this carbon. We've eliminated them. Now, this one right, this product right here, or the Hoffman elimination gives us Hoffman products, which is another way of saying uh, anti zaitse Anti an anti zaitse uh, product, because the zaitse product would have been something. It would have given a product like this, because we we've learned that this alkene right here is more thermodynamically favorable because it has a, a, a more stable double bond because that double bond has more alkyl groups attached. It's more substituted. This alkene is di-substituted and this one is mono-substituted. And we've learned in previous lectures that a di-substituted alkene is more stable and more favorable than a mono-substituted. But when you do a Hoffman elimination, you get the anti zaitsev product. So what would an example be right here? What if we had, let's say, a halogen here, and we treated this with terp butoxide right here? We added a little bit of heat. This would have given us the, well, let's see. No, no, let's say... Let's do the, the hydroxide and heat. What would we get? We would get the disubstitute product. But if you wanted this product, we could do a Hoffman. So let's go through the mechanism of this Hoffman elimination. It's really cool to see how this all works. So the first steps, or I should say step, is a SN2 step. So what we can do is we can expand this guy out like this. You can see that nitrogens or amines are very nucleophilic. So we could do something like this. We will do a SN2. And we would generate this species, NH2, and I'll put the methyl group right here. Okay. <clears throat> let's, let's expand this out a little bit more. Make this look a little bit better, shall we? I'll go NH and then go another H. CH3 like that. Right. So that nitrogen um, has four bonds to it, so that makes that positively charged. Right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a pro. So that was an SN2. And now let's do a proton transfer. And we're going to take and to do this proton transfer, we need some base around. And so we'll just use another mole of our amine. And that's going to come in and do our proton transfer. Okay. Like so, to give us our this product right here. Nitrogen, hydrogen, C. Well, that's not going to be good. Let's move this over, shall we? Like so. And then this species right here would still be around. It's just not going to be protonated. 
like that. Okay, there's its conjugate acid. Now, what we have learned about when we want to alkylate an amine, we can't stop at just one alkylation. So what's going to happen is this, this is going to react. This species right here is going to react with another methyl iodide, and that's going to get turned into not showing them all the mechanistic steps, but you will repeat this one and this one, and you would get, so that, let's just say we have an SN2 and another proton transfer, and that's going to give us this compound right here, CH3, CH3, like that, okay? Now, we still have a amine with lone pairs. It is going to react with the methyl iodide one more time. Okay. So it reacts one more time with our methyl iodide. So the lone pair comes in, attacks the methyl iodine, right there, and that's going to give us this species right here. And what have we just generated? We have generated a quaternary ammonium salt. There's our quaternary ammonium salt, okay? And so that's the end product of step one, okay? So now I'm going to clean off this board, and then we'll take this species and treat it with step two and see what happens next. So here's our quaternary ammonium salt. We have iodide floating around. When we add... In step two, our silver oxide, okay. when we add silver oxide, don't need to worry about the mechanism for this step too much. Just realize that the silver oxide replaces the iodide with OH minus. So what happens here is it's just going to this whole step, it's just going to go right to here. Okay, so let's do this, CH3, and so it's taken the iodide, iodide, and replaced it with hydroxide, okay? That's what happens when you add the silver oxide to the quaternary ammonium salt. It gets rid of that. Okay. And it's going to precipitate and it's going to give it and give us this species right here. And now what we have is a strong base, and we are going to now do a E2 mechanism. Let's go this way. An E2 mechanism to uh, give us our final product. Now, what we have going on here is if we numbered these carbons here, let's number them. So one, two, three, and four. We see that what we have here is, is this quaternary ammonium salt. And what that's done is we, we have converted this amine, which is a horrible, horrible leaving group, into a good leaving group. And so if we want to do an E2 mechanism, we're looking at this species right here simply as just LG or a leaving group. And so we have to look on the carbons that are adjacent to carbon 2 and find the hydrogens 
that we're going to eliminate. So we could see right here that if the hydroxide right here comes and uses its lone pair to grab this proton, breaks that bond like that, and does this, what would our product be? What would it form? It would have formed the Zaitsev's product. But that's not how the Hoffman, re Hoffman reaction works. It doesn't do that. It makes the Hoffman product or the anti-Zaitsev product. And so this base that we have here, all right, so this E2 step is step three. Forgot to mention that. That's just adding heat. That base is going to come and abstract the proton on carbon one. And then eliminate and kick it off like so. And that will give us our anti zaitsev product. Like that. Okay? So that's the mechanism. So when you take a look at uh, any molecule that you want to do a Hoffman elimination, you analyze the two adjacent carbons and you look to see which one will give you the least stable alkene. Now, I'm going to proceed now to explain in detail using a, well, our Newman projections to understand why this is the case. Right. So that's what the, the last part of the video is to rationalize in more detail why we get this product. Okay, so here's our molecule, our quaternary ammonium salt, and you see that I just inverted it from what you saw previously. Okay, that's not a big deal here. So the question is, why is this hydrogen on carbon one the one that's going to be abstracted in the E2 uh, mechanistic step? Well, in order to answer that, let's take our eyeball and look down carbon one, carbon two, okay? And we're going to draw the Newman. Now, I'm going to draw this Newman and I'm going to do some uh, rotations that I'm not going to show you how I did them. I'm just going to draw the Newman to best explain what I want to talk about, okay? So there, we're going to have our quaternary ammonium salt up here. So I'm just going, I will now expand those out like so. I see H3. That's going to be positively charged. And so that is definitely not the uh, front carbon. Is it? That's on carbon two. That's our back carbon. On our front carbon or carbon one, what do we have on carbon one? We just have three hydrogens. Right there. And so the circle is carbon two. And what's attached to carbon two? We have our ethyl. So we have our CH2. CH3 and another hydrogen. So if we number these, what do we have here? That's carbon one. The ring is carbon two. And so that would be three and four, like that. Okay. And we'll put carbon two here. Just write that there. Okay. Now I want, so there's our Newman. Now let's compare looking down the carbon two, carbon three bond and see what we get. And I'll draw that in a different color here. Okay. And I'll just keep it all on the same level here. Okay. And so what do we have here? We have the same, we have hydrogen, CH2, CH3. And that is definitely, oh, I keep messing that up. Let's see here. CH. Okay, so now carbon two is our front carbon. Okay, so let's number those. 
And then, so our front carbon right here, that should be CH3. And hydrogen, perfect. And then we have a hydrogen there, our methyl, and another hydrogen. So what's the number? Let's double check our number scheme. The front carbon is carbon two. The circle has to be carbon three. So that would make that carbon four and that carbon one. Okay. So now in this green Newman, we are asking the question, this hydrogen right here. Why don't we abstract that hydrogen? Okay. Well, just remember that when we do an E2 reaction, we have to have the leaving group and the hydrogen being abstracted, antiperiplanar. And that's what we have. So this hydrogen right there is that hydrogen shown there. You can see that they're antiperiplanar. And so that's this hydrogen that you're going to abstract. This one. Why is this one not so good? Well, it has to do with a steric argument. In order to do that elimination, we have to get our Newman to get this hydrogen right there, which is this one, anti to the leaving group. But when we do that rotation around the carbon two and carbon three bond, look at what we're gonna have happen here. We're gonna have this methyl group, which is bulky. And then we're gonna have this methyl group, which is bulky. And all that, the ammonium, uh, quaternary ammonium salt is very bulky. So we're going to have some steric clash right here that prevents this, or increases the energy of this conformation so much that it's just not favorable. This is the favorable conformation. And so this hydrogen is the one that's going to be preferred. So the reason why Hoffman elimination gives you the products that they do is based off of a steric argument.